That's true. Naked Palpatine. Um. <laughs> oh, oh, you think that one? Fresh out of the clone tank, nude Palpatine is my That's well, the first thing I think of when you say Dark Empire Palpatine. the Star Wars Expanded Universe, now we did by Disney, or can look at film, whichever way you slice it, Legends. Today, I have for you Book 4 of Legacy of the Force, Exile, by Aaron Alston. So, another banger. I'll say, I think this one's weaker than... The previous three um, actually it's probably better than the first one but surprisingly at least so far it seems like Olsen's kind of been the weakest out of Travis and Denning which is crazy to say but it's still really good um, this furthers this doesn't really focus on Jason too much there's a lot of stuff with him in the beginning and there's a lot of stuff with him in the end but the good chunk of it is mostly on Ben on Luke and Mara, on Han and Leia, and Wedge, and Corrin, and a lot of other people. So Jason's story kind of takes the back burner. This is furthering the conflict with the Corellians and the Galactic Alliance. And also right off the bat, what an amazing thing that this book has done, or this whole series has done, because if you remember in like episode three in the little title crawl, it talked about the Clone Wars. Now there were heroes on both sides. And I'll say this, in the EU, you never really got to see that. We never really got a perspective POV of the Confederates. You know, of the Separatists. We didn't get to see it. Was General Grievous seen as a hero? We don't know. Was Dooku seen as a hero? We may get some mentions of that, but we never really get to see that. In fact, the one props I'll give to, you know, the Filoni Clone Wars shows, we have a couple episodes that are dedicated to just the political realm, where we actually get to see some of the politicians of the Separatist faction, and how they're, they're good people who just want independence, you know? And that was something that was surely lacking in the normal EU. So... But still, in, in the grand scheme, it was good guy, bad guy. Meanwhile, the true evil was behind the scenes. And it's a similar thing here, except you actually have even more nuance. Because you have the Galactic Alliance, which has, you know, most of the Jedi. And, you know, behind that you got Lumaya. And you have Jason. On the Corellian side, you did have Thraken. But Thraken's been out of the picture since book two. But what do we have now? Well, we have Wedge, who's a good person. We know this. We've read the X-Wing books. We've read the X-Wing comics. We've seen New Jedi Order. We know Wedge is a good person. But not everybody in the Corellian government is. And you got people that, as we saw in the last book, wanted to assassinate Tino Ka. So this is truly a scenario. And then, of course, Han and Leia. So you have a whole scenario where you actually have heroes on both sides of the conflict. And this is truly where you get to see it. Now, things are getting even worse and things are coming to a head. And Wedge retires because he doesn't agree with the government and what they're doing. He doesn't agree with the... Um, Galactic Alliance either, but he doesn't agree with Corellia either, so he just takes early retirement. But of course, people want to use that for political means, so if they can assassinate Wedge and Tilly's, that can further help motivations to stop the Galactic Alliance. So he has to be rescued, and he has to leave with the help of Cornhorn and his daughter. He escapes. And there's a lot of other things going on. Um, Jason needs to become a Sith. But in order to do that, he needs to sacrifice someone he loves. 
but he has so far been kind of reluctant to do so. And on the other hand, he needs a Sith apprentice, or he can never truly be a Sith. And he wants it to be Ben, because of their connection, their friendship. So, he tasks Lumaya to test him, which will eventually lead him to Zyost. Will Ben Skywalker fall in the suit of his canon name and join the dark side? Or will he deny those evil thoughts and remain in the light? You have to read the book to find out. But there's a lot of phenomenal parts of this book, I have to say. It's, it's pretty stellar. It does kind of drag a bit, I feel. I don't know why I'm feeling this with all of Olsen's books. They just feel to drag a lot of the time. But overall, it's still phenomenal. Everything in this book was really good with, you know, dealing with the politics of everything, dealing with the Maya shenanigans, you know. And again, people just ignore all the, all the development. People are like, how could Jason become a villain? How could he go from wanting to save Luke, that's the whole reason he turned, right? To wanting to kill Luke, which right now he still doesn't even want to kill Luke. But that's the thing. Despite what the Unifying Force, your holy maker, tells you, the dark side is real, and it corrupts. And this series has been proving it time and time again. Ben even reflects on this in Zioth. Little part I'll mention real quick in the non spoiler section. Because he's been taught by Jason. He believes as Jason believes, which is there is no light or dark side. What matters is intent and action. Because if you're a good person, then you're a good person. There's no technique, no ability that will change that. Because the force is just the force, it is the unifying force. It encompasses everything. If you fall to the dark side, if you become evil, it is because you were always evil from the get-go. And that is what Unifying Force taught. That is what Vergier taught. You are the villain. You always were, or there was always potential to be, if you become evil. Not because there's anything else influencing you. Which is just factually false. Ben is on Zyos. He starts sensing all this darkness and ancient eons of darkness still within this place. You make a similar case with Dagobah. How can there be dark side energy or dark feelings if the people that had those feelings are long dead? Unless there's something more to it than just... Vader chose to be bad, or Palpatine chose to be bad. There is choice involved. This is another issue that relates to real life things, where people think, well, if God exists, then free will can't exist. That's not true. So you can still have free will, and still have spiritual forces like dark and light influence you. You can still have the dark side be an influence to corruption, and still be your choices down the road, leading to it. But again, this book shows an excellent example of the subtleness of it, because Jason's not a large part of this book, but he is further descending. Book one, I will turn to the dark side because I don't want my uncle to die. And if I don't join the dark side, I have visions that he shall pass away and die. And I don't want that. Book four, he's not trying to kill his Uncle, he doesn't necessarily want his uncle to die. But you know what's interesting? He's starting to resent his uncle. Because his uncle doesn't respect him. And he's always annoyed when he has to be around them. He'd rather go do his thing, leave them be, because they're starting to bother him. And he doesn't want them around. Does he want to murder trillions? Not at the moment. But already something's shifting. He initially turned for the sake of his uncle. Now he could barely tolerate being around him. Again, it's called character development. It's called dark side corruption. Slowly but surely, his mindset, his views are changing. And the only reason he hasn't flipped to 180 like Anakin Skywalker does in episode 3 near the end of the film 
is because he's yet to truly become a Sith. Once it happens, then he'll be a villain, but only after all that character development, which so many people choose to ignore. But overall, there were so many amazing parts of this book. Um, uh, you know, from the, the plot with Han and Leia and Wedge, and how that all kind of converges to everything with Ben, which was just stellar, love Ben, to everything uh, with Jason, as little as it was in this book, was just phenomenal. And I do highly, highly, highly recommend this novel to you. I'm going to get into spoilers now. If you don't want spoilers, don't get into it. Next time, we will review another controversial book, one of the, more so than even an entire series of this series, which is Sacrifice by Karen Travis. Super controversial for one specific reason, which we will dive into next time. So until next time, guys, may the force be with you. If you don't want spoilers, get out. If you don't leave, your fault. Also, might I add, isn't this just like awesome? Look at that. Look at Leia. Isn't that just freaking amazing? Considering she barely did any Jedi things in New Jedi Order, even though she had that potential. But here she is, finally being awesome. We begin with Jason dreaming of Leia fighting him to the death. But it was just a dream. We get Kip in this book, which is really great. Always love to see Kip show up. As we start to notice, again, it's subtle. It's not a big deal in this book because it kind of puts a back burner on Jason's uh, character development. It is there, but it's not the main focus of this book. Jason gets a little bit angry more often. If things don't go his way, if frustrating, frustrating things start to happen. Whereas before, you know, he could kind of deal with it. And he still does, but it, he just kind of lets it show. He gets a little bit more angry now. It's subtle, but it's a change. Character development. I know, crazy, right? Funny that. Jason and Wedge have a discussion. Because again, Jason doesn't want to kill everybody. He doesn't want to be a super big villain. He just wants... There to be peace between these two factions. So does Wedge, but Wedge doesn't agree with the Galactic Alliance is doing. Doesn't agree with what Jason's doing. And they have this phenomenal discussion about that. It's a really, really good discussion between the two of them. Um, and it makes Jason think about a lot of things. Did I write down about it, or do I just remember from heart? Yes, Janus, Jason's tarnished perception. Because he looks back on his life, him as a child making jokes, being funny, to the Vong War, to now. He's, again, character development. He's not the same person he once was. And he's willing to live with that. And then he reflects on his mom and dad and everything. In the last book, he tried to shoot them down because he was traitor, because he thought they were traitors. And then he learned he wasn't, and he felt immense guilt over the fact that he almost killed his parents on a falsehood. So then he debates in his mind over and over. Did I do the wrong thing? Yes, you did. You tried to kill your parents, but what if they actually were spies and it would be the right decision? I don't know. And it's conflicting and confusing and intense. But then he finally comes to the conclusion, no, I did make a mistake. But if I learned, with absolute certainty that my parents did try to kill Alana or Tino Ka. If, if there was 100% proof, unverifiably, no, nothing to dissuade that notion, if I knew that it was true, if they became traitors, then I could. I could do it again. Character development, slope falling, phenomenal. If you don't like it, you just don't like the direction. Get over yourself that you think it's badly written or anything else about this series. 
to all those haters out there. It's written well. It's executed well. It provides enough context and reasoning. You just don't like it. And that's okay. I don't particularly like every flavor of ice cream. Does that mean that the flavor of ice cream I don't enjoy is bad inherently? No, you'd have to provide evidence that it isn't the right consistency, it isn't the right taste, it isn't whatever. Like if I ask for strawberry ice cream and it tastes like banana, then that is an objectively wrong strawberry ice cream to give me because it's not strawberry ice cream, it's something else entirely. But there's objective wrong things and then there's personal preference. And in this case, this whole series, it's your personal preference, not fact. Thank you. Anyway, it was a phenomenal scene. Jag kind of becomes a more important figure again. You know, he has nothing. I feel really bad for him. And this is, you know, Troy Denning's fault because of darkness, but luckily he'll bounce back. And it does help explain some things. If Jag is a part of the Chiss ascendancy, how could there ever be a fell empire in Legacy? It makes no sense. He's part of the Chiss. Chiss wouldn't allow that. So there has to be a point where he willingly... But why would he willingly do that? He loves the Chiss society. He loves being a part of that. So it does, in a sense, make sense that he'd have to be excommunicated from it. So that he can go into other pursuits. Right now, he has nothing to do with the Empire. But by having nothing else going on for him does provide a back reason for him to eventually take up that mantle and to eventually lead to that dynasty that will exist in the long future. It is interesting that one of the biggest flaws with Omaya is perhaps her perception of beauty. And she has a constant need to kind of portray herself in a certain light, which I find interesting for her. Because she seems to be pretty cunning and manipulative and pretty smart in every area. But she can't get over her appearance. I remember in earlier books, there were mirrors in her entire room so she could look at herself from every angle. This is a person who cares very deeply about how they look. Which is just interesting. Considering. Jason puts Ben on a secret mission to stop this secret Sith artifact. It's all a sham. It's all to get Ben in certain situations. But he goes to this planet to take care of this thing. But what he needs to grab isn't there. He finds out it's on Zyost, which is actually the main goal of this, is to get him to Zyost. So we'll, we'll get back to that. Which is an ancient Sith planet. That we saw in the Tales of the Jedi comics. Another note on Jason's descent. He gets annoyed with Jason, or he gets annoyed with Luke and other characters because Jason deserves respect. Again, it's a small thing, but it shows the change in his perceptions, the change in what matters to him. He, and you're right, the Unifying Force wouldn't give a damn. Even in Darkness, he really doesn't give a damn because he knows who he is. He doesn't care what other people think. But now that he's actually embracing the Sith teachings and the dark side, now respect matters a lot more than it ever has before, even in Dark Nest. Because he really didn't care what you thought of him in Dark Nest, because he knew what he was doing was right. But as the dark side corrupts, some things start to become more important, like pride. <sighs> Booster. We get Booster. He's very old in this, because he's already kind of old. But it's really cool to see Booster again. Of course, it's Alston, so... But it's it's great to see Booster. Uh, I already kind of mentioned this in non-spoilers, but... Alston states what I've been saying forever. While he's on Zyost. The whole section of Ben on Zyost is pretty phenomenal, too, not gonna lie. But, as I said, there's a particular moment where he talks about, you know, there's this whole thing with this guy that has the thing he needs, and he plans on killing him, but there's a little girl there, 
and he realizes, oh, this guy's, what's going on here? This is not what I thought it was supposed to be. I thought this was like a dark sider, but it's just some dude. His daughter may have force potential, but he doesn't. And he's dying because he got attacked by some mysterious TIE fighter. And so Ben starts taking care of the little girl. But throughout it, voices in his head keep telling him, you should protect her. You should protect her. Okay, you protected her. Now you should eat her. You gotta stay alive. You gotta protect yourself. You should eat her. 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 But he ignores it, luckily. Um, because this was all to kind of put Ben on a very, very strong dark side presence world where he would be corrupted by certain decisions he'd be forced to make. Like, oh, I'm gonna starve and die. Gotta eat this girl. That will keep me going. Because the dark side does corrupt, and it is corrupting him because he's getting angry, he's losing control. But one uh, candle is enough to light the darkness and love can ignite the stars. He doesn't fully give in. And he, you know, thinks about, you know, I don't have to worry about that because Jason taught me that there is no light or dark side. There's only you. But if that's true, how can I feel all this darkness on this planet when the people that felt it haven't been here for ever, for a long, long time? Because the dark side exists. So Alston agrees with me. But, that being said, um, the whole section with him, just going through Zyost, you know, overcoming odds, not succumbing to darkness, is so Skywalker, ultimately. So like his father. And the potential for him to be one of the greatest Jedi Knights, Jedi Masters, Grandmaster of all time is there. So sad that we didn't get to see him become an adult and truly flourish into such a great, inspiring man. Unless Disney decides to give us more someday. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. But what we get here on Zyost, phenomenal. Um, I like that... Lu the Luke and Mara kind of get something's right and something's completely wrong, which they get a theory that Lumaya had a daughter, and that was a dark being that died in the first book. And so Lumaya wants revenge on Ben because she thinks that Ben, they think that Ben did it. And so I, I just think it's great, like Matt, Matt Wilkins said it in his reviews, but it's, it's great that they are slightly right and completely wrong because, you know, not everybody's going to just, we know everything because we've been reading it all, but it makes sense why characters in-universe wouldn't. And of course, they don't want to think that Jason's becoming a Sith Lord or anything. So that's not the first conclusion they're going to go to. And again, Jason's resentment. He's starting to resent his family. Again, it's a slippery slope. By the next book, it will be complete. And then he will be a villain. But only after all this character development. So there's attack on Corellia. But guess who? Fenner. That one Imperial dude? Yeah, I'm not counting the fan fictions where he shows up, but last time we saw him would have been like Starfighters of Adamar, I think. Maybe. But he's back, and he joined the Corellians. And the Bothans, because of the Maya, join the fight, and it causes something that was kind of like this cold war where it wasn't truly a war yet into something real so now there's actual stuff going on with the confederacy and everything kind of like the separatists yes it's kind of like the prequels but completely different contexts um but yeah so we got this going on now so and then we have the ship that Ben flies out of with the little girl. Here's another thing for you, just to piss all you haters off. There's a vision that Luke gets in New Jedi Order about Ben flying a ship that is nothing like he's ever seen before. Perhaps it's a Vong ship. Well, it's not a Vong ship, it's an ancient Sith ship, and that's what he flies out in this book. Continuity, accidentally. Haha, ha. it works now in context because <laughs> it is a very weird design, but it's just cool that I can now make that inference from New Jedi Order into this. 
And other people won't because they don't like it. And then, of course, the finale. Jason must make a sacrifice. He considers his parents, but then he realizes, do I even love my parents anymore? I don't know. I mean, you can still love people, but not necessarily like them. He, like, really doesn't like most of his family anymore. Because they've been so opposed to him. And I mean, think about it, too. I mean, they almost disowned him because of what happened to... He reached out to them. They rejected him. I mean, for obvious reasons, because of what he did. But still, he made the effort. In his eyes, he made the effort. And they scorned him. So as you spend less and less time with your parents, I mean, I mean, just think about it on, on a day-to-day. -day. If you have a friend, right, a good friend, and you two hang out all the time, then you move. Maybe one gets married, has kids. You don't. You're doing your own thing. And then you guys don't talk. And a couple months becomes a couple years. Becomes, it's been like 10 years since you've talked to your friend. Like seriously talk to them. Is your bond going to be the same? Maybe. But most people, you drift apart. With that gap of time of spending time together. Now it's not that large of a gap of time. But he's got a bunch of other things going on. He hasn't even had time to really think about his parents. And they've been away. And antagonist, antagonist, antagonistic toward him. Why wouldn't he get a little resentful? I'm not saying he's right. Just saying that it's understandable. Luke and Mara basically scorned him since the second book. Mara's been a little bit more forgiving, but still, she's not particularly happy with him either. And everybody's kind of scorned him, but this is, of course, what he said he was willing to endure. But it's still going to produce resentment regardless, which will fuel hatred, which will fuel the dark side corruption. So it makes sense to me. But it's clear to me he doesn't care enough about his parents to kill them because the person he sacrifices, he has to deeply, truly still care about. Alana, Tino Ka, who now? I do think it would have been better if it was Tino Ka. We're not going to discuss here who he does end up killing. We'll get to that in the next book. But I still think it works, if not as best as it could have. And I do think it is mildly an issue, not because of the decision to kill this particular person, just because I don't think it's the most emotionally satisfying for that. But I still think it works logically and consistently. Um, and it, do, it does provide a really good payoff for other characters. So, and good excuses for why certain characters can't do certain things. But we'll get into all that in the next book. Overall, this is solid. And this is still better than, like, at least four or five books in New Jedi Order. Like, I have to be real. Like, it's just written. Like, I'll take this over Rebel Stand. Sorry, it was just a huge side quest that had nothing to do with the main plot and was a waste of time. Was it fun? Yeah, because it's Alston. But was it important to the plot? No. Therefore, it wasted my time. Um, ultimately. I mean, it wouldn't be a waste of my time if it wasn't a 19-book series, but it was. Hence the issue. Anyway, though. Phenomenal read. I'm so excited to get back to Karen Travis and see what she has to write about with Sacrifice. Until then, guys, may the Force be with you.